We like to save the best for the last. Um, if you've come to Show Me Con at any time, you have seen this guy. Uh, I met Jason 10 years ago. Uh, my mentor, Ralph Etchemendia, introduced me to him years ago. Um, I've had the honor of speaking in Iceland, in Romania, uh, all over the world. And one of the coolest things about it is Jason's there. And uh, when we started doing our con, I was always like, I get to finally have a friend in my town and not necessarily like, oh, I'll see you in Romania in November, <laughs> which I'll see you in Romania in November. Right. Um, if you don't know who Jason is, I'm going to give you his nice little bio. But Jason is, is he's going to let you know who he is. So Jason Eastry is the author of Dissecting the Hat, the Forbidden Network from Sinjuress, I can't ever say that, Sinjuress. I don't care either. I don't okay. even know. Creator of Dissecting Hack, he's spoken at DEF CON. He is actually one of the main people that helps ensure that DEF CON keeps going on. Derby CON, Yukon, and several other cons. His uh, life story can be found under Jason E. Street. That's J-A-Y-S-O-N, E. Street. He's a highly... A uh, carbonated speaker who's taken uh, pizza, Pizza Hut, all over the world, uh, from Beijing to Brazil. He does not expect anybody to still be reading this this far. <laughs> but if they are, please note Jason was chosen as Times Person of the Year 2006. <laughs> please give it up for my friend and colleague, Jason E. Street. <laughs> And that's literally totes legit. You can Google Times Person of the Year for 2006, and you'll see the cover, which it says you. So if you were around in 2006, congratulations. It's like Times Person of the Year 2006. How are we doing? Yay! So I still don't know what time zone I'm in, but uh, I've been assured it's central, so we'll just go with that. Uh, this is the talk, I pwn thee, I pwn thee not. Uh, basically, it's the things that I love to do. I love for my uh, victims, uh, targets, uh, clients to, to, to do when I'm robbing them. And uh, three things that I hate for them to do when I'm robbing them because it makes it harder for me to rob them. Um, it's like, uh, I can't, oh, there we go. It's like perfect example for a nice offer. Oh, there you go. It's like, see you in Vegas, DC801 party, awesome. So, um, you notice how that doesn't even phase me. It's just life's weird, right? Uh, so, a little bit about me uh, is just all you need to know is that I do uh, social, uh, social engineering, security awareness engagements, physical compromise. Uh, you can see some of that done on National Geographic. It's like you've seen me in the news, but more importantly, you see me in your server room on your surveillance footage in the lower left-hand corner. It's like those are actual footage uh, uh, videos or pictures uh, from me robbing things. That's uh, actually a computer that I took from a, a teller in Beirut. Uh, just walked in, didn't even say hello, unplugged the computer, while they were doing business beside me and then walked out. Um, that was a finding, by the way. It's like that was in the report as a finding. Uh, so, uh, so that's what I do. It's like, but I also like to educate. It's like that's the key thing I like to do. It's like uh, red teaming or uh, penetration testing, whatever you want to call it, whatever you think makes it sound cooler, what you do is like it's one basic function. Your job is to educate the blue team, the defenders, the clients to make them better secured at the end of the day. It's like if you go in and you break into something and it's like, and you like, woohoo, I went in, I punched them in the face, they had no plan, finding, you know, you've wasted their time. Your job there is to defend. Your job is there is to help protect the defenders and make the defenders better. That's all red teams do is to make the, the client better. Um, and you see so many different uh, variations of that, you know? It's like I hear, I go to so many conferences and I see all these people talking about like all these obscure and high tech, very, uh, very sophisticated attacks. And I'm like, those are cool. Uh, but can I just walk in off the street and just like, you know, grab their server? It's like, I don't know how to do a SQL uh, injection that'll get me to drop the database. It's like, that sounds difficult and complicated. Uh, I just walk in the server and I take the hard drive where the database is and I walk out with it. It's a little bit easier for me. It's like, you know, for each their own. So it's like, we hear about all these high level attacks, but we're not talking about some of the basic low level stuff that gets everybody. 
It's like, and when red teams come in, they do a disservice to their clients because they go in and say, oh, we went through the ceiling panel and stuff, you know, and we used some Freon gas to open up the motion sensor. And it's like, a, we roped in. It's like, a, we took a picture of a, from a jelly belly and stuff, you know, was able to fool the biometric thing and get into, it's like that's, and then the client's like, whew, thank goodness we're safe. Because that's like a high level. I mean, you were like ninjas. It's like, we don't have to worry. That's not our threat model. We don't have to worry about that. It's like, so we're cool. It's like, y'all guys were like, awesome, y'all are ninjas. It's like, we don't, we don't, our threat model's not ninjas or nation states. It's like, it's always nation states. But still, it's like, we don't have to worry about that. It's like, so what I try to do is I try to remove all of that. It's like, I go in and say, uh, I never been in this building before. I didn't know who the manager or the people were. I walked in on the first minute and within two minutes and 22 seconds, I'm now behind your teller line and I have full access to everything in your bank. That's a problem. It's like they don't have an answer for that because you can't just walk that away. It's like you can't just walk that. So that's why I like to do it the easy way. It's like it's not that I can't do it. I've had to do some jobs where it's a little bit more sophisticated than that. Not by much. OK, but it's a little bit more. But it's like I like to do the most basic. So it's like there's no defense for it. Uh, and we have another problem in uh, information security, and that's what we need it's like what we're trying to build you know your executive management is like the picture on the left like that's what we need build that protect us it's like and we're like sure we can do that it's like what's our budget well we can afford what's on the right okay we need what's on the left but we can afford what's on the right do your best Lose your job if you don't. It's like, but do your best, right? It's like, that's what we have to deal with. It's like, so I want to give some basic advice. It's like, I mean, everybody accuses me of being basic anyway, but it's like, I want to give some basic advice on what we can do to better protect ourselves that you can take back today uh, to help with. Um, and so one of the things that I love more than anything else that I cherish beyond all measure is employees not empowered or educated to question the unusual. That gets me every single time into a building, into a site, into a server room, into a computer, into a network, and into the jackpot. It's like, uh, I was on, an, and I, I tell people, it's like, and what I mean by that is, there's nothing worse, uh, there, there's nothing worse than uh, a false sense of security, right? I think so. It's like everybody thinks it's like everybody thinks they're protected. And I'm like, no, no. It's like uh, there is something worse than that. It's like it's like uh, not no security, but that false sense of security. It's like that's what the problem is. People going in and thinking that, oh, he had to go through. There's physical guards at our doors. We've got uh, RFID badges. It's like we've got uh, can, can secured areas. It's like so if someone's inside there, they must be trusted. And so therefore, when I come in with a clipboard or a, a, a worker shirt saying I need to do something, I'm trusted. I must be okay. No, I'm never okay. It's like, but people act that way. I was on a job in January. It was a very secure uh, facility. It's like I had a, I, I dressed in a jacket. So it's like, uh, and I, I dressed a little bit like the, the rest of the, everybody. Uh, and so I came in and I told him, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm with IT. We're checking the USB rights on your computers because you shouldn't be charging your phones or devices from the computer. You should be charging the devices from the outlet. So we're doing this USB rights to make sure that that can't happen. And I have a cable, an iPhone lightning charger cable there is no phone attached to this cable. It is just the cable. And I plug it into their computer. And then I pull this detonator out of my jacket and I swear to goodness, it looks just like a detonator, a little square box with a little light and an antenna. And I didn't have to pull it out, but I did it for effect because I wanted to get caught. I wanted them to question it. I pulled out the detonator, boop. I didn't say boop, okay? I was tempted, but I did not, okay? So boop, and it's like, and all of a sudden, notepad pops up on their screen. It automatically types out, uh, test completed successfully, thank you for your cooperation, smiley face emoji. And I'm like, okay, cool, the test, uh, thank you very much uh, for your cooperation. It's like, uh, I'll do that. Eight people in the same area. No one questioned me how my cable activated their notepad. 
I go back because I do, like I said, I do security awareness engagements. It's like, I don't just, it, it's not useful if they're not educated, if they're not understanding right then and there on that day when the impact is still fresh, that something went wrong. So I go back to them after the engagement is over and I go back to each person and I question them. It's like, didn't you find that a little odd? <laughs> Just a teeny, just a teeny bit. And it's like, yeah, I did. Now that you mention it, it's like, uh, I thought it was a little weird. It's like, uh, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to feel like I, I didn't want to interrupt. And it's like, I didn't want to like cause any trouble. It's like, no, cause some effing trouble. It's like, that's okay. It's like cause a ruckus. Some guy just came and plugged the cable in and somehow your notepad activated. That's catchy AF. You should be talking to somebody. Okay. <laughs> So it's like, so that's what we need to do. We need to empower our users that it's okay for them to question when something unusual happens. You are not having every day of your job weird things like that happening. It's like, and if you are, check yourself, you may be on an 80 sitcom. But if you're not, it's like, it's like, then you need to question and you need to contact security. You need to let them know, hey, this was really weird, what's happening? Um, one of the things I hate, it's like, uh, I'm not talking about this guy technically, but uh, it's like, is open lobby spaces. I mean, let's face it, I don't know if this is what the CIA lobby looks like, because trust me, if I ever visit, it's going to be going through the back door with the bag over my head. It's like, I'm pretty sure. It's like, uh, I'm on a lot of lists for some reason. Uh, and so, I know exactly why. Uh, but, uh, but so public spaces are well monitored and highly uh, visible. I hate those kind of spaces. It is so hard to loiter in those spaces. It's so hard to case to place in those spaces. It's so hard to not be uh, getting attention in those kind of spaces. So I was, uh, uh, this no past November, I was in Moscow. It's like I'm reading the faces so I know where the feds are. Okay, good, got them. Uh, and uh, I was uh, asked to visit... Um, Kaspersky's headquarters, because uh, Eugene Kaspersky is a friend of mine, and yes, I'm now on another list, I'm sure. Uh, but, um, but so I was invited, I was in Moscow, so I decided to go and visit the headquarters, and I am telling you, as soon as I walked in the door, it's like, it was like, it was an open environment, but there was this nice couch there, and I'm one of those guys that's like, when he, even when I'm not on the clock, I can't go off the clock, you know, I still got to think like, what could I do here to cause destruction? You know, it's like, it's just a habit, okay? I don't actively cause the destruction. Uh, destruction. I don't actively go and do the bad things, but I can't help thinking about it, right? So I decided instead of just going straight to the receptionist deck and checking in, it's like, I'm just going to sit down and check it out and see what, see what the layout is. You know, it's like, I think that'd be cool. It's like, man, as soon as my butt touched leather on that, on that couch, this big security guy, I'm pretty sure his name was Ivan, you know, just walks over. He's like, excuse me, comrade. Uh, can, he didn't say comrade, but you know. It's like, uh, uh, how can I help you today? It's like, uh, do you need to register with someone? Or are you, uh, do you have an appointment? Very polite, okay? But when your muscles have muscles, you're allowed to be polite no matter which way you want to do it, okay, right? It's like, I mean, he was literally wearing these, these black trousers and this shirt that was like either two times too small or his muscles four times too big for it. I don't know which, but it's like, uh, but he was very polite and he guided me, he was so helpful, uh, and guided me straight to the receptionist desk so I could check in and validate that I was supposed to be there in the first place. And that, my friends, is exactly how you do it. It's like there was no confrontation. There was no obvious like, you know, I'm being distressed or there was something that I could complain about. It was like he was doing it as a, as, a, as a service, like I'm helping you. It's like I'm trying to be nice. But at the same time, letting me know, mother, you ain't getting away with this. It's like you need to go register. It's like and that's how your buildings are supposed to be. It's like, that's how your lobbies are supposed to be. It's like, they're supposed to be where people are registering and then waiting for the, but they're not just loitering. They should be registered and accounted for as soon as they get into your facility so you can account for where they are at all times. Um, so that was well done on, on, on uh, their part. And it's like, uh, and it was a really cool tour. It was like a really nice facility. Um, so I'm going to get out of that because I'm probably going to get into more trouble. Um, one of the things I love is uh, no egress filtering uh, uh, or internal monitoring. Um, and I, when you got to talk about fails, it's like I can't help but add the TSA because they provide so much uh, examples of bad for me. Um, and, and this one, it gives me a TSA agents miss mock weapons more than 70% of the time. 70% of the time. You had one job, right? 
And like, and, and I, I bet you their main excuse is going to be, it's like, yeah, but no four ounces of toothpaste made it past, did it? <laughs> so there. It's, um, okay, the battle axe and the bath lift, maybe, okay? But no four ounces of toothpaste. That's a line we're not going to cross. So that's one of our biggest problems, is that we're having our uh, people, it's like we're building the security and we're thinking, like, let's make sure our firewall's blocking all activity coming out. Uh, are going in. Make sure that we've got that hardened perimeter. But then when it comes about, you know, outbound traffic, any, any, no monitoring, because, you know, it's trusted. It's coming from inside. The attacks are usually coming from inside the house. Okay? Have you not watched any horror movies ever? Right? And more so now than ever, your attacks, your actual point of uh, egress uh, is that compromised machine in accounting. It's like that's been compromised and now using the controls that you put in place to then con connect to the command and control and compromise your internal network. And then, I mean, look at Sony. It's like, seriously, I mean, not most of the movies lately, but still, the company, they lost over one terabyte of data during their breach. How the f do you miss one terabyte of data leaving your network to Paraguay? It's like wherever it went. That's a little odd, right? Just a little bit? I mean, even from a network standpoint, I mean, what did they do? The network guys go see all that traffic leaving going, oh, we need to increase the bandwidth on this. It's like there seems to be a lot of traffic. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why wasn't security looking at that going, maybe we should check that out? Bob, you know, is like has never really released, you know, one terabyte of data going to South America. Maybe we should check into that. You should be monitoring and filtering. You're, no one should be able to connect outside that network unless it's from a policy procedure that backs it up on the firewall rule. It's like I one of the payloads that I use on my bash bunny because I don't do I don't do compromises. I don't do exploits. I, I do security awareness things. One of my security awareness things is basically I, op I plug in the bash bunny. It opens up command prompt. It types in telnet to uh, tau.blinkylights.nl. And all of a sudden in a command prompt, you see Star Wars and ASCII. It's like playing animated. It's like through your telnet which is really sort of cool. Except for the fact you should not have Telnet going to the Netherlands, it's like on your accountant's computer. Correct? Am I crazy? Well, yes, I am crazy, but still, is that, that's crazy. Why is your accountant allowed to go Telnet to the Netherlands? And why isn't there someone at my, that desk when I'm there within five minutes asking that question? Because there's no proper egress filtering. We're not monitoring what's leaving our network. We're so concerned about what's coming in. It's like, you're so busy trying to build the walls. It's like, we got to build a wall, make it bigger. China APT is going to pay for it. It's like, well, guess what? It's like, they're going over that, and then they're just walking out the front door. And we're letting them, because we're not monitoring what's leaving our doors. We're just so busy trying to barricade them. So one of the things I really hate, it's like... Uh, not, 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 not sneakers. I'm not hating on sneakers. Sneakers is a good movie. Don't, don't start getting flame wars on me. Um, but dual factor authentication. That's a problem. It's like to get, to deal with, right? It's like, because I love doors that are just like, that'll just open up or the pin pads. Those are nice. It's like, but when you put an RFID or a hid badge, which I could easily clone with a Proxmart or a boss cloner, it's like, that's awesome. But then you put that pesky P uh, keypad there, and I'm like, mother... F it's like, that's not cool. That's not playing fair. I'm trying to rob you all nice and stuff, and you're being difficult. It's like, you know, where's the fun in that? Well, for me anyway, right? It's like, and so I have to give you... I, I, one of the, the same story that I did about the cable uh, back in January, they did something very cool and mean to me. It's like I took all the time, all the time and trouble to sneak into their facility, going through the freight elevator, and they had a security uh, pad and card in the freight elevator entrance lobby. So it's like they created their own little little lobby inside that couldn't uh, I couldn't get in. Uh, I mean, it took me 13 minutes and acting like I was on the phone until an employee let me in. But I got in, and I'm like, uh, so I'm in the section. I'm like, woohoo! 
ooh, I'm getting ice cream, right? And so until I decided to leave that one section, they owned the whole floor. They owned two floors in this building. So I get to the glass door, and I'm like, it's like, oh, that's a, I can't go anywhere else but this section. You have to badge into each part of the building's floor, even though you're, it's the same company. They still segmented the actual floor. What the actual, you know? That's not cool. I mean, it was cool because I was able to steal someone's badge that they left there on their desk. It's like, and then get in. But at first, I panicked. That wasn't nice. It's like, so, but then they segmented, but they segmented and it took multi-factor authentication. I love people that, I've done so many different banks and gone into their main headquarters and it's like, and you need, to do million dollar wire transfers, it's not a simple process. That's some serious business, right? It's like, they need to protect that stuff. You need to protect your identity. You need to own that identity that you did that so that you have USB keys. You have a key that you have to plug into the computer. Has there ever been a time I have not found a USB key already connected to the computer when I came in to steal it? It's like, the answer is no. It's like every single effing time. It's like, if it's not on the computer, that's okay. Don't panic. Open up the middle drawer. It's right there. <laughs> it's like, so you got to make sure that you have two-factor authentication, but you got to make sure that it's an actual two-factor. It's like, you got to make sure that it's actually going to actually be used in a secure way. It's like, so, but those are the things that, that really pisses me off. It's like, I do have a problem with that. Um, now, the next thing, it's like, I love people that don't follow established procedures. Everybody says, well, we have a procedure against that, or that's against company policy. It's like, oh, I know it is. It's like, but here I am, right? It's like, and this is a great story about, sorry for everybody that's in the Air Force, you know, sorry, hashtag, sorry, not sorry. But uh, this was actually on Ellis Air Force Base in Nevada. It's like two civilians somehow breached an Air Force base and were found only when one of them told the airman she'd been kidnapped. Her attacker grabbed her, put her in the car, and just started driving. It's like, we're leaving. It's like, here's a good road. Well, I'm going to like, you know, hide. And it's like, we got to find a place to, 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 to ditch her and like, you know, uh, and, and hide the body. It's like, well, here's this an abandoned area. It looks seems pretty abandoned. Let me just drive in. Didn't stop at the gate. The guard didn't go, hmm, that's odd. That car, it was a civilian car, didn't check in. Seems legit. It's like, uh, let's not bother reporting that. It's like, and then the guy got on the base and then he realized, oh wait, I've made a horrible decision. You've made several by that point, buddy. It's like, uh, and so starts trying to drive around and was able to stop. She was able to get out and escape at that moment and was able to talk to the guards. It's like, and notify them of the fact that it's like, I think someone broke a procedure here or two. I don't think she said that. It's like, but that's what happened. Uh, and it's like, you've got to establish procedures. It's like for a reason. Security has procedures for a reason. Another good story that I have to say, because it's really funny, and once again, at the expense of the Air Force, uh, it's like, I have nothing against the Air Force. It's like, I, I make fun of everybody equally. Um, but it's like, there was this one where back during the Cold War, a Russian agent drove up onto a, a U.S. air base in Germany. He then proceeded to walk up to a plane that had a missile attached to it. He detached the missile. It's like, put it in a wheelbarrow. I don't know if he stole the wheelbarrow too, but I really hope he did, okay? It's like, put it in a wheelbarrow, wheeled it to his uh, Mercedes. It's like, we're in Germany after all, right? He put it in the back seat attached a red flag to the tip because it was sticking out of the window and German laws are German laws, okay? It's like, and drove home to his apartment, disassembled the missile, it's like, and mailed every piece back to Mother Russia. And I mean, the, the German mail system is impeccable. It's like every piece got back there, okay? It was like, it was just insane. I think there were some policies that weren't enforced there either. It's like your policies aren't good unless people know that you're going to enforce them. Your policies are not good unless your executives own up to them and are part of them and are responsible for them as well. 
It's like, if your executives don't have to follow your policies, congratulations, you have no policies. It's like, if your exe uh, executives are exempt from your security procedures, guess what? You have no security procedures. You have a wish list that's like that the, the chumps use. Okay, and then other people go, well, I report to that guy, so I don't have to follow those either. And then those people go, well, I report to that guy who reports to that guy who reports to that guy, so I don't have to follow them either. And the only one that's following them is like, you know, Ed and stuff, you know, in the mailroom going, oh, well, at least I got my stapler on, I'll follow these policies, you know? It's like, that's not gonna work out well for you, okay? You have to make sure your policies and procedures are there, they're enforced, and people are aware of them. You have to make sure that happens. Because if they don't understand that and they don't believe that they have to follow those policies, then you've got really not much of anything. Now, um, this was sort of my education part of ramp part of there. And it's like, and you're asking yourself, like, what exactly is the point of this? It's like, well, one of the part is to educate. It's like to tell you about some of the things that I like about that. But now I want you to know some of the questions you should be asking your work area, your space, your employers, your enterprise, your wherever you're working, whoever pays your paycheck, it's like, here's some questions you need to take back to your users and to your security team. It's like, here's some questions. For, for you. It's like, for one, really, insider threats, which one fits the bill? Do you really understand what an insider threat is? Is it really just a, it's a, is it really just the, uh, the malicious actor like Robert Hansman? It's like, and, and I like the feds going right now, why is he always picking on us? It's like, just put me off the list then maybe, okay? It's like, uh, so it's like, so maybe it's a malicious insider threat. Or let's be honest, sometimes it's just stupidity like on the right. It's like, I, and, and I love this fact, it's like on the right, the TSA, divulged willingly for an article all the, the prints for their uh, keys so you can make duplicates of them. Now, that's sort of bad because that opens up all your luggage. All your secured devices can now be opened up by anybody, a luggage handler, anywhere around the world because they can 3D print those things. When asked about it and accused about it, like, how dare you, what, what are you doing? The government, the same government who wants the keys to all your mobile devices for your encryption keys went, well, that's not really a security practice. We don't really care. It's like too bad that the keys are out there, but you know, that's not our problem. Sure, I want you to have my encryption keys now. Yes, that instills me with so much confidence. It's like, so that is a, ve a threat vector. Those are both insider threats. One was malicious. One was actively trying to destroy your network, trying to do damage to your company. The other one just did it by accident. If your company goes out of business because of one or the other, does it really matter which one it was? You should be preparing and protecting for both. And also, if you're going to do that, it's like, you need to understand it's like, when that threat happens, how you respond to this. I call this the fail burrito. I added this slide this morning at 6.30 something. It's like, I'm not sure if you're aware of the Border Patrol had a employee, a contractor, who against company policy and procedures, copied over 500 gigs of data off the uh, Homeland Security's computer network, which was against their policy, and what did they do? They put it on their network, which was then breached and then downloaded. And the Homeland Security, you know, being the wonderful, responsive government entity that they are, sent out a thing going, uh, sent out a press release going like, we're not going to divulge who it is, but we're talking to them. And it's like, we scanned the dark web. It's like, and I'm sure that when, when marketing heard this, like they scanned their, she talked about scanning their, it sounds cool. Just leave it that way. Okay. It's like, we scanned the dark web. It's like, we found no traces. Everybody's safe. Don't worry. Nothing to see here. And the document they released it on the metadata showed exactly what company it was. So good job on that one. Uh, and then Joseph Cox here was like able to go, really? You scanned the dark web? That sounds like a great idea. Let me try. Oh, look, here's the 500 gigs of data you said that you scanned the dark web for. I found it within five minutes. Maybe you should look into that. I mean, I call this the fail burrito. 
Because you put a little bit of fail here, and then you add some more fail, you wrap it up in fail, and it's like, whatever you do, just look at it, don't eat it, because you're going to get sick, okay? But it's like, that's what they did. And it's like, so thank you, Border Control and Homeland Security, for once again providing us what we're not supposed to do on anything. So uh, that's an issue right there. It's like, that's an issue, because that's, once again, your data, and what's going to happen? Well, those contractors are going to learn a lesson. Those contractors are going to freaking pay the penalties. They're going to have to deal with the repercussions. I'm joking. They're fine. It's like they're still doing business with them. There's like they were like, don't do that again, and they're good. It's like that's what's going on right now. So, yay. Um, one of the other things you do. How do you ask for an identification? Who do you ask, and how do you ask? Which one of these people would you ask for identification? The answer is all of them. It's like, I threw in a little trick question because the, the security guard actually has a badge, but you still ask for everybody. It's like, that's who you ask. It's like, you make sure from the CEO to the guy in the mail room, they should all have identification and they should all be asked for it. It's like, I remember I did a security awareness training class for all new hires at this one online bank. And a week after one of the classes, the owner, not this, well, I think he was a CEO too. He may not have been, I don't know. He was the owner, he owned the effing place, right? He was trying to get into the second floor where our data center was, and he didn't have his badge. An employee, literally only there for about a week and a half, saw him coming and he was like, uh, sir, you can't come in here. It's like, you don't have your badge. I need to escort you to the, to the front office. It's like, do you know what that owner did? It's like, people would say, fire. It's like, that owner went like, that's a very good response. It's like, let's go up there and let's make sure that we take care of this. It's like, goes up to the front desk, got a visitor's badge. It's like, until he could get his other badge and then left and got that guy's name to us so we could properly thank him for a job well done. How many other people tried to get an exception to that rule? How many other people in that company thought it was okay not to have their badge? Zero, because the owner lived up to the policy and the procedures and took them seriously. So if the guy who owns the company is going to live by those rules, by golly, everybody else is, right? That's the way it works. So uh, what do your employees think a password manager is? Please tell me, because I'm literally legit curious, at what point in history, it's like it had to be like in the 60s or 70s, that someone looked at their keyboard and went, hmm, that's a good place to put a password. I don't think no one's ever going to look under there. I'll just put my little post-it note under the keyboard, we'll be fine. It's like, I mean, how many people have done that? How many people have looked under a keyboard and found a password? In, their, in the course of their business, how many people have looked under a keyboard and found a password? Yes. That's why we drink, right? It's like... <laughs> That's one of the indicators, I'm sure. <laughs> it's like, it's like, so what we need to do is like, so I've got a great, this, there's no blinky lights involved in this. It's great for security awareness, and your team can do it right now. Set up a schedule for, for, so you cover every single company, uh, branch, outpost, whatever, office and floor throughout the year. It's like, no matter how long it takes, it's like how many, but just pick one floor a day or a week or a quarter, whichever is easier for you to do. It's like, and have your security team go through that floor and look under every single keyboard. You're going to be depressed at first. A lot, okay? You're going to be depressed a lot at first. It's like, but do you know what you've done? You showed them that you're real. You showed them that someone is looking, someone is trying to make sure that the policies are enforced, and you are, even if you don't find anything, you're going to find something, okay? You're still making a valid effort to show people like, hey, I'm with information security, I need to look under your keyboard, we're doing a password sweep for security, okay, thank you very much, sorry to interrupt, it's like, and you go through that the whole way. That right there is invaluable security awareness engagement for your users, and that didn't cost you a dime except for a little bit of time. It's like, I'm a poet. I know it. Don't worry. Uh, it's like, so that's what you need to do. Start creating 
um, that kind of rigorous uh, inspection and let people know that those passwords are serious. Go and do uh, tutorials. How many of your users know that the space bar is a valid network login character? The space bar. That is the best key on the keyboard because I don't write passwords anymore. Passwords are so 2010, right? I do passphrases. I freaking write the effing Iliad now, you know? It's like, I got the space character, I got the space bar. It's like, it was the best of times, it was the worst of time. Exclamation point. Time I've got a one instead of an I and a three instead of an E. It's like, that's lead hacker speak right there, poetry. It's like, you know, it's also uncrackable. Win-win. Show them that they can use the space bar. Show them what a good passphrase looks like. Show them how they can use their song lyrics or their favorite movie quotes as a passphrase on their different systems and servers. And then on a post-it note, they just write Gmail Terminator 3. As long as it's not, I'll be back. Don't use Arnold Schwarzenegger quotes because they're always like, to the chopper, I'll be back. They're very short, okay? It's like, it's like so, so get them to like some, some better uh, quotes from different movies. It's like, you know, a little bit longer quotes, a little better uh, sing, uh, uh, song lyrics, okay? Because let's face it, if it's like, you know, Gmail, Rick Astley, we know it's never going to give you up. It's like, so, it's like, tell them to make it a little bit more obscure. Yes, I just Rick rolled Show Me Con. Uh, so, uh, that's one of the key things that you have to do. It's like, educate your users on how to be better at it and, and, and give them that and empower them with that education so they're like, okay, I'll start using passphrases. Because what happens when you make them use a special character and a lowercase character and, and, and a number and it's like, you know what? They write really complex, really, you know, eight character, 12 character passwords that they have no way of remembering. So they put it down on a post-it note and put it on your keyboard. It's a vicious cycle, people. We need to break it. So show them how to do passphrases. Show them how that helps and makes it more effective. Now, another thing is, what does your social media profile really say about you? It's like, uh, there's been a, a big debate on the, uh, the, uh, the, the Twitterverse lately about people using uh, employee social media profiles against them. It's like, uh, my whole take on that is, huh? It's like, I'm not supposed to use one of the biggest gold mines in the history because people might think I'm a bad person. I'm trying to rob you. We've established the fact that I'm a bad person way long ago. Okay? Bad people are looking at social media profile. I'm not going to go in and create an account and make a relationship with a person and tell them that I want to marry them and go on for six months until we start planning the wedding and then go, surprise, it was a fish. I just wanted your accounting information. Sorry, you just booked that thing to Aruba. We're not going. Okay? That's a little extreme. Okay, but I am going to use my fake accounts to go in and peruse Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. And I am going to use that information to gather as much information as your employees are willfully putting out there to the public, to the public, not to like friends. I'm not accepting your friend request. It's like I did get a guy on LinkedIn to endorse me. I was a 23-year-old female redhead who just had finished uh, going, getting my CPA, and I was an accountant, and so it was really wonderful. It's like, and he endorsed me for my uh, tax uh, information and my accounting experience. He gave me a lot of good endorsements. It's like, and I got a lot of good compromise. So it's a win-win situation for everybody. Uh, but I don't usually go and do the involvement. I'm using those to gather information. There was one particular teller, or I don't know if they were even a teller. It's like there was someone in a bank branch, and they literally had on a public profile, I was not friends with them, and trust me, after that talk, I will never be friends with them. It's like uh, it is, I, show, I could show, I had a screenshot of showing the ad friend button. I was not their friend. So publicly to the world, they had their phone number, and their home address available on their about page on Facebook profile. This is at a time in America where people are still being kidnapped, held overnight to open up the bank the next morning to be robbed. And the next slide that I showed was a picture of their house. I'm not creepy, okay? I didn't actually go to their house to take a picture, okay? It was Google Street View. It's like, but I showed that picture. 
And people were upset, mad, disappointed in me. I mean, I, I get that a lot, so it was okay. But it's like, but still, it was very upsetting. And I'm like, you don't think bad guys are doing this? This is what bad guys do. They do bad guy things. It's like the only difference between me doing this and all the other people that are doing this right now is with me, you get a report. You're being pen tested at this moment. You're just not getting the report. That's what you pay for. When you're getting a pen test, you're not paying for the actual attack and all the other stuff. You're, you're getting paid for that report at the end of the time that tells you how to fix the issues. Because there's like five other people in Paraguay testing the same exact thing. It's like, no offense to any Paraguayans, but it's like, uh, I just like saying Paraguay. So it's like, so that's one of the issues that you have is that you've got to watch out and you've got to make sure your employees know by being an employee, they could be in a target. They have to be suspicious of who's trying to friend them. It's like, who's trying to look at uh, their profile? Who's trying to connect to them on LinkedIn? If they ask them questions or they send them uh, unusual quizzes. I, I literally saw this one quiz, the top 25 things about you. And I'm like, that's interesting. It's like, uh, oh, let me look at these questions. Oh, these are the top 25 password reset questions for email servers and banks. It's like, what a kawinky dink, right? It's like all those things like, you know, what Game of Thrones character you are. It's like, who cares about that now, right? But it's like, uh, it's like what Marvel he uh, hero you are. It's like, what's this? What? It, all those things are mining your information. It's like, you don't know where it's going. Okay, everybody wants to be Tyrion Lannister. Everybody's uh, Iron Man. It's like it's just it's what it is. So it's like so stop trying to answer those. Now another thing is, one of the, sorry I hate picking on these people a little. Uh, fishing is one of the leading causes of compromise. But does your employees really take it seriously? That's another thing that uh, that was just recently on uh, Twitter. It's like I'm on Twitter way too much. Obviously, it's like uh, and but that's one of the problems is that one company was trying to sue their employee for doing a phishing attack. And I'm like, for the first time, no, that's not cool. It's like, but I'm one of those guys, if your employee keeps clicking on malicious links after you've re-educated them, after you've told them what the threats were, and they still doing that, then why aren't you firing that employee for doing it? If you have a delivery driver that keeps wrecking your van, do you keep that delivery driver on the payroll? And that's just like a $50,000 vehicle. You've got employees costing you $300 million. Maybe you want to look into some, you know, corrective measures. So, and this attack, Target, over $300 million, how did that start? Phishing email. I mean, I mean, trust me, the CEO of the HVAC company was quick to say, we were a victim of APT. APT got us. What does APT stand for? No, that's what they tell the board and that's what they tell their shareholders. APT stands for adequate fishing technique. That's what APT stands for. They tell the other stuff to their board members, okay? Because they want to get out of it and make it not their fault. But nine times out of ten, that's what started it, was a phishing. And if that's what started it, if you know that there is a problem in your production line, that one of your robots that is assembling your car is every once in a while not bolting down properly one of the parts in the engine, so every third car that you put out there blows up and kills your drivers, would you fix that? I mean, not if you're General Motors in the 70s, but would you fix that now? Okay? Suck. Too soon? <laughs> it's like, it's like my bad. They literally waited for 13 people to die, but okay, whatever. It's like, I'm the bad guy. It's like, so, uh, you would try to fix that. We know that phishing is a, an attack vector that is being used regularly. We know that your employees are being targeted. If your employees don't consider it part of their job, to be cautious when opening emails, then you're failing your client, your, your users, and your executives. You're failing them, not them failing the company. We keep trying to get technology 
to protect the users against themselves instead of getting our users properly trained to protect the technology. That's what happens. They're your best asset. Stop treating them like a liability and start treating them like they're part of the team and let them be aware that they're part of the team because guess what? They've never not been part of your team. So we need to get that going. We need to get that. I mean, and it's a broken record and it's like a horse I'm going to keep on kicking and a windmill I'm going to keep tilting at. Sue me. Not really. I don't have any lawyers. I'm very bad at business. Okay. So uh, what metrics do you have that helps to justify your budget and your actions? I've had three conversations on two continents just in the last two weeks about this subject. It's like about budget. How do I get upper management to buy into this process? And I'm like, how are you showing them what you do? It's like, they, will they consider us a cost center? Well, of course they consider you a cost center. The better you do, the less they see. It's like, I love going at the end of the year. So if you know, you go to your boss, like, hey, have you noticed uh, nothing really bad happened to our network? We didn't get breached. And nothing. Well, if you give me $2 million, it's like, I'll make sure nothing happens next year. It's like, it sounds like a mafia, you know, uh, mafioso. So, you know, like, it's got a really life business. I'd hate to have something happen to it. You know, give me a couple hundred thousand more. Can make sure that doesn't happen. I'm just saying, you know, it's like, that would be bad. It's like, and I'm very bad at Italian mafiosos, but still, um, that's a bad thing. So give them numbers. How many fire, do you log the hits on your firewall that are coming in? The answer is Yes. It's like, and what do you do with them? You discard them every 30 months like every, uh, every other company does in the world, right? Because who wants to read through them? But do you record how many hits come in? Put that mother in an Excel sheet and you've got a number. You've got a metric. It's like, but Jason, that doesn't make sense. Who cares? They're not really going to look at it. They want to see numbers. Give them numbers. How many IDS alerts do you get coming through the thing? Well, we haven't properly tuned your IDS. I know you haven't properly tuned your IDS. Everybody here knows you haven't properly tuned your IDS. That's not a secret. But it's numbers that you can use. How many spam emails get through your email gateway? Well, Jason, that's not really a secret. We don't care. Those are numbers. Use them. Get those metrics. How many machines do you have in your network? We don't really know. You better effing find out soon. Okay? Because that's just bad. That's besides the point. That's not even part of this talk. I'm going on a rant. You need to find out how many machines are in your network. Okay? Because if the guy in Paraguay knows how many machines you have and you don't, you have one extra machine you really need to be worried about. Okay? <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Know how many machines are on your network. Because sometimes they have the habit of increasing by one. And you're going to have a very bad day. So track how many machines you have. Track how many of them are patched properly. And put that in a report. And that report, when you first get it, is going to suck really bad. Because now there's going to be, you know, attached, uh, you know, actual responsibility. We hate that. Okay? But then things start getting better. And you get to start showing improvement. And then at the end of the year... You go to the executive and you say, hey, you see how our metrics improved and we're trying to get better on this and we're on task. Well, we're trying to increase that. We're going to need a, a patch management solution and we're going to need an asset manager tracker and we're going to need these other things to help make sure that we're running smoothly and we're actually going to be able to do this increase. It's like, can we get a budget for that? And they're going to look at the numbers and they're acting like they're going to read them. It's in a pie chart so that you're good. It's like, uh, and they're going, yeah, okay, yeah, we, we can do that. It's like, uh, we need to get that done. That sounds like a good idea. It's like, uh, so that's how you do that. So... And one of the last things, it's like I'm going to say, is educate and empower users. Can you ever have enough for that? The answer is no. Always make sure your employees feel empowered to say something's wrong. I don't know who that person is. I need to report them. It's like, I don't know where this email came from. It looks suspicious. I need to report it. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. That morning, a person manning the radar station, one of the first radar stations in the world, and this was at a time when the world was at war, and this was a Navy base. Or is it, was it an Air Force base or a Navy base? Uh, Navy, okay. So I'm picking on the Navy this time, so there we go. So it's like, a, so on a Navy base, Pearl Harbor, it's like the person manning the radar station 
sees planes coming from an abnormal vector, from an unusual direction. And they do their job. They report it to their next in, uh, next in command. They go, sir, it's like we've got planes coming in from an unusual vector. What do we do? Do you know what that person said? Person looked at it, knowing that we, the world was at war, knowing that they were a military installation, seeing a whole bunch of planes coming in, and their immediate reaction was, that's probably our training planes. You just disregard. Spoiler alert, it was not the training planes. It's like, everybody's like, Jason thinks we're bringing down the whole room now. It's like a Debbie Downer. It's like, we're doing so well. Then woof, it's like war. Uh, so no, but that's one of the things. It's like, because they did not, human actions are always going to be, this seems bad. I don't want it to be that. Give me another alternative to it and I'll buy it. You have to get your employees off that. You have to get your employees to be suspicious, not to be paranoid, not to every time they get an email, it's like, is this a trap? It's like, what's going on? You know, it's like, no, I don't want them tackling the FedEx guy, okay? It's like, because sometimes that might be me, okay? And I'm fragile and I bruise easily, okay? But they at least need to report. They at least need to report those suspicious activities. They need to have a chain of command. If you're, if you don't have an extension or an email address that every single one of your employees know to report, you don't have a security program. How are they going to report that? I literally remember one time I'm in a Mon Jordan and I'm robbing this bank and the manager is frantically telling me, and I've told this story many times, I know, but it's still pertinent. I was plugging in a USB drive and she's telling me, it's like, sir, you can't plug that in. And I'm like, you're right. I shouldn't be plugging this in. It's like, you should talk to someone. I, should, I know I'm supposed to be doing that. But if you don't know I should be doing that, well, then you should definitely tell someone I'm doing that. It's like five machines because she didn't know who to call. Paul, she did not know what to do. If I would have gone in with a ski mask and a shotgun, I would have had a very bad day because they are trained for that. They weren't trained for a guy with a, uh, a suit and a USB drive. Please answer that until I'm busy. It's like, so you tell them that, you show them how they need to act, how they need to be suspicious. And not just like saying, oh, it's gotta be this way. It's gotta be this person. I mean, someone, I've had, I think I know of at least three different enterprises that have pictures of me up on their sock going, warning, if this guy shows up, it's like, you know, call the, call the cops. It's like, uh, and I'm like, well done. You protected your facility against me. <laughs> All the other thousands of people coming after you, fair game. But I'm not, I'm not getting in. It's like, so you've got to make sure that they understand, just be suspicious. It's like, just ask questions. Don't take everything for granted that that person's supposed to be there. Or that person's really from IT plugging in a cable to check the USB rights on your mobile device charging policy. It's like, let them question. Whew.